So the title of this talk is what the Yandex leak uh, tells us about how big tech, tech issue you te big tech uses your data and uh, please welcome our speaker Kaylee McCree over to you. Thank you so much everybody for sticking around especially post happy hour. All right, so this is going to be a fire hose. I have a lot of information to throw at you in a very short period of time, so <laughs> bear with me. All right, so today we are going to be talking about Yandex. It's a Russian search giant, a massive platform. It has over 90 different services under its umbrella. It kind of owns everything in Russia. And its parent company, Yandex NV, is actually based in the Netherlands. And some of its products are actually used globally, like its taxi service, for example, is in Israel. That just made the news. Big drama there. We'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so in January 2023, almost 45 gigabytes of Yandex's source code was leaked on breach forums, which has since been shut down by authorities, RIP. Uh, this is the post screenshot courtesy of uh, Bleeping Computer, which had a lot more foresight than I did in capturing that screenshot. Uh, Yandex confirmed the leak, so we know it's real. Um, they denied that it was a hack. Instead, they said basically a former employee leaked this, uh, this code base. So first we're going to go into a teeny bit more background, then we're going to dive into the code. We're going to talk about what they're collecting, what they're doing with that data, and who they are sharing it with. And then we are going to wrap up and hopefully have enough time for Q&A. So there's been, there's been much drama this year. I'm going to try to do the very quick and dirty version of it. So after Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, the West began to express concern about Yandex collecting and storing the data of Western users in Russia where it might be vulnerable to Kremlin abuse. Um, privacy researcher Zach Edwards sounded the alarm about Yandex's AppMetrica SDK sending analytics data back to Russia. Now, AppMetrica is sort of like uh, Yandex's version of Google Analytics. So it's supposed to be for growth and product teams to see how their app is working. It's embedded in hundreds of millions of apps globally. Some of them are VPNs, which are, you know, supposed to be protecting your privacy. And some of these apps specifically target Ukrainian users. You can see why that is now a concern. Yandex pushed back um, pretty strongly that they ask for consent and that their data is anonymized, but even at the time, experts and researchers disagreed. And uh, you can see even their own website uh, is pretty fuzzy on just how uh, anonymized and non-personalized their data is. So this is their, their big statement in response to that drama from last year. Yandex acknowledges its software collects device, network, and IP address information, but it called this data non-personalized and very limited. It added that although theoretically possible, in practice, it is extremely hard to identify users based solely on such information collected. Yandex definitely cannot do this very carefully worded statements. A lot of lawyers put a lot of time into that. So at the same time, thousands of Russian engineers, including Yandex's, are fleeing the country. And Yandex faced increased pressure from the Russian government through increasingly strict media laws to spread propaganda about the war in Ukraine. And then at the same time, um, its executives faced um, sanctions from the EU because they were spreading that disinformation. So they were sort of squeezed on both sides. Um, its executives, because they're getting hit with sanctions, its executive director and its CEO both stepped down last year, raising big questions about who is even running Yandex right now. It appears to be just the board. Um, and uh, Yandex's parent company decided, the one in the Netherlands, uh, decided to sell off first its news products because propaganda drama um, to the Kremlin-controlled social media app VK. And then they decided they might as well just sell everything else, um, raising big questions about where all of Yandex's user data is going to go when it gets sold to whoever it gets sold to. So almost immediately, um, this Putin ally, Kudrin, he's, Alexei Kudrin is the former finance minister, very close Putin ally. He agreed to become Yandex's advisor on corporate development to advise on this restructuring, read the sale. Um, which just further tightens the Kremlin's control on Yandex. So as of now, 
Yandex is still up for sale. Um, in June, Putin actually approved a bid from a consortium of, of billionaires, read oligarchs, and VTB Bank, but um, that clear, appears to have been vetoed by Yandex's foreign investors because they have to find someone to sell it to who they won't think face sanctions for selling it to. Not a lot of people left. And there's also this really weird new Russian law where foreign um, investors selling their Russian assets have to do so at at least a 50% discount. And there's a 10% tax on top of that. Um, so it's not going to be pretty. So there aren't too many people left who Putin will um, approve a sale to and who Yandex's foreign investors will uh, also accept a sale to. So essentially, um, nationalization is rumored to be on the table. So now we are going to dive into this code. So the code in the Yandex leak, it's broken down by service or application. Um, it's written in a mix of Russian and English. They use a variety of coding languages, but it's a lot of Python and C++. And then YQL, Yandex query language, it's a flavor of SQL. Um, and this leak, it's just the code itself. It's not a Git repository, so we don't have the version history, we don't have the databases, we don't really have the machine learning model, just sort of the very basic bones of them. Um, so basically, I can say what this code most likely does, but I can't say for sure what was actively being run at what time. Disclaimer. So we're going to start with Metrica. So that server-side app Metrica data is in a service called Metrica with a K, which encompasses the data both from that um, SDK for mobile and also the desktop analytics version. These are some of the raw data fields that Atmetrica collects. Remember when Yandex told the Financial Times that the data it collects is non-personalized and very limited? Sure. So you can see at the top that it is going into something called an anonymizer, but nothing about this level of detail is uh, non-personalized or anonymized, and it certainly isn't anonymized when it gets to this point in Atmetrica's servers. You're going to see from how it's used that it, it, they never really anonymize it. So to start with, these unique identifiers that were at the top, they're getting hashed. And that's lovely and theoretically anonymizing. Um, they're still going to be very unique and uniquely identifying because that um, hash is going to add a ton of entropy. And that's going to make it very easy to match probabilistically with other data as it comes in so that they can sort of combine and get a bigger picture of household activity. Um, all you really have to do is hash any incoming identifiers and then see if the outputs match. So it's going to be both private and functional in theory. Uh, but whatever this is actually supposed to accomplish, um, they, they render it completely meaningless. So also, AppMetrica is taking in some really precise location data. Uh, it's not that uncommon for App Analytics to take in latitude and longitude so this product and growth team can see where their users are. But what's not very normal is taking in a user's altitude, direction, and speed, which together with a timestamp gives you a very disturbingly accurate picture of a user's movements. Unless the app you're using is like a run tracker or Pokemon Go, there aren't a lot of use cases that justify that. With this uh, information, if someone is using your app on an airplane, you could tell how high it's flying, how fast it's going, and in what direction. And I think that's overkill for product and growth teams. So let's take a quick look at how ineffective that anonymization is, starting with these fields. A Wi-Fi SSID, if you don't know, and if you're here, you probably know, is essentially the name of a Wi-Fi network. So if you're connected to the hotel or conference Wi-Fi right now, that's your SSID. So here we have these same fields in crypto. Um, so straight out of Metrica, that's the source. We have that device ID. We have the original device ID. Whether either of these fields are hashed at this point, unclear and honestly irrelevant, you're going to see why. So here are those exact Wi-Fi fields again. And thanks to the hashed or unhashed, who knows, uh, device ID, they are attached to a unique identifier. And here, both that device ID and SSID are being matched to a Yandex user ID, which is very important because that Yandex user ID gets matched to a whole lot of other pools of data in Yandex's servers, and we're going to get into that. So one possible motive to select both device ID and SSID, as you've probably guessed, is that an SSID will have multiple devices associated with it. So you can sort of use that to detect a relationship between devices and say, oh, this user has multiple devices, or this is a household, et cetera. You can do a lot with it, and they do. So here we have identifiers that come in through a click event. They're being matched with any IDs 
any IDs, hashed, unhashed, <laughs> uh, until a match is found in the system so that the events can be processed and correlated with the pre-existing data about that consumer or household. So for example, it's comparing the plain Android ID, the MD5 hash, the SSA, it's SHA1 hash, which if you're here, you probably know those are not great hashing algorithms at this point, pretty out of date. Um, the fingerprint right here, it's generating, generated using some of the raw fields that we looked at, like client IP, OS version. It's a pretty standard fingerprint. You know, you take device information, put it in a dictionary, hash it, you get another unique, unique identifier that makes it easy to find that device again when it uses your, your app. So even after anonymization, this data is still being effectively used to identify matches. And again, that's how anonymization is supposed to work. It is still supposed to be functional. So then as this new information comes in, it gets matched with user sociodemographic attributes and they update them as necessary. This is a pretty small example. Um, here they're using age band, which is a lovely but pointless uh, tribute to privacy because they do have exact age at other parts of the system. Um, but it's a nice attempt. Um, and then gender, they just have male or female in this case. And it's all associated again with that device ID, which you can see at the bottom has to get hashed before it is sent over the buffer, which suggests that it was probably processed and stored unhashed, um, which is pretty inconsistent and renders, well, it renders the hashing pretty pointless, doesn't it? So Metrica also has code related to this Yandex's audience product which allows users to generate segments for targeted advertising or user profiles using data from Appmetrica, third-party data brokers, or their own data. And in the first two cases, consumers who end up in the segment don't have to have used your app before because it can be used to generate fresh leads. So you can use audiences to get information about whatever users, basically. So let's get into crypto. So. Crypta is Yandex's behavioral analytics service. It analyzes all of this data it has access to and it has access to a lot of data. Um, and it identifies specific characteristics to put into segments for ad targeting, theoretically for Yandex ads and also that audiences product. And it takes data points from all over Yandex's services in part because Yandex ads advertises all over Yandex's services. So here are just some of the examples of the segments that Crypta generates. Here we have smokers, which seems to track users who purchase specific smoking products. Uh, nothing exciting, we're talking e-cigarettes, tobacco. Summer residents, which tracks which users have dashas, which are resident summer homes, and how often they visit them. And then we're gonna look at a few more of these. Travelers uses geolocation to track when you've gone from your main region, which they have already determined, to another region, and whether that travel was domestic or international. Mail data appears to pull from email data to track whether you have any boarding passes. Remember, Yandex has an email service. So it's pulling from email data to track whether you have any boarding passes, plane tickets, or hotel confirmations in your email. This gas station segment um, seems to process where you bought gas, like physically visited a gas station and bought gas. Um, and, you know, it seems pretty plausible that if Yandex can make these segments, then anyone who buys Yandex and gets access to Yandex's data points could easily make a segment like, you know, young men of military age trying to leave Russia very quickly or generate segments based around vices and blackmail. So this is a very basic example of a household composition that crypto stores. We've got that household ID, that's important. Size, gender, any elderly, unfortunately, they said has old, little cringe, um, and has children, but of course they, we've already seen, they have much more precise information than that. The household information is honestly the least creepy thing about crypto. <laughs> So once again, we've got AppMetrica data. It's associated with a device ID and it's being used to pull Wi-Fi information. Apparently they haven't heard of 5G yet. Um, this time is tracking connection types for uh, a little segment. Once again, at Metrica SSIDs uh, being used for processing, um, presumably to deduplicate user records because they can say, oh, this is associated with a common Wi-Fi access point. They're using it for cleanup, basically. These are some examples of data pools that Crypto uses for processing for the purposes of its fuzzy matching in its graph segment. Crypto pulls 
login and email data. Um, actually, no, I want to back up really quick. So here we have a lot of email data. We've got geolocation for home and work locations. Household, been there. Rakens, that is search data. SSID, they love it. I don't know, they can't stop using it. So here we are. Crypto pulls email and login data and it associates it with the Yandex user ID. So if you connect any so-called anonymized data from at Metrica to a Yandex ID, Crypto can associate it with email and login information, which pretty effectively re-identifies it and that's super convenient for law enforcement. Here we have Crypto just like shamelessly scraping for every type of identifier it can think of. Yandex um, uses a passport system. It's like one Yandex login that rules them all, logs you in across all of its services. This form takes in first name, last name, phone number. Crypto has some of this data. It can definitely take a passport user ID and match it to a phone number. You can see that source type passport profile. It implies to me that they probably also have all that other information like first and last name, but I did not catch them actually using it. Passport phone dump certainly suggests that they're just scraping these phone numbers on mass. So one of the things that happens in graphs is that the process of lat they process the latitude and longitude of your predicted home. Again, they've already done some processing here, and they associate it with your index ID and everything associated with that. And they plot it on a little geograph, which they then use to find and plot your literal neighbors and their index user IDs and all of the information associated with that. So here we have data from two Yandex products being used by Crypta in a super creepy way. Uh, no method should be called extract children from taxi, that sounds terrible. Um, and this is part of a very long process that involves pulling children in ages from search data, then from app Metrica, and then from this taxi app. Um, and they pull it all together to create this very holistic picture of how many children are in a given household. And if you zoom in on that last section, you can see that once you have one kind of ID, whether it's household, passport, crypt ID, Yandex ID, you have them all, transitively anyway. And all of the identifying data that is associated with them, which we've just seen is plenty of identifying data. You can do plenty of that. So these profiles also integrate biometric data and it's most likely from Yandex's smart speakers, which use um, their smart assistant called Alice who is supposed to be able to interact effectively with children, play games with them, make up fairy tales cute. Um, so Crypta uses voice biometric data to identify children and their age range by voice to further build out the household profiles. Um, that voice biometric data, probably from this Alice product. Um, it's not unreasonable for a voice activated product to be able to identify children's voices so that it can interact um, appropriately with them, but this isn't in the Alice product. This data is in Crypta. It's been taken out of Alice and its original function and its original purpose and intent. And now it's encrypted being used for behavioral analytics. You can also see from that socio-demographic that they have birth dates. They have specific birth dates. And Crypta has a UI portal to display some of this household and user profile information like uh, marital status, income, children, some very basic interests. And you can search these individual profiles by Crypto or Yandex user ID, which suggests that they're not just aggregating them. You can search for more information on individual consumers. And Yandex appears to be able to associate all of these IDs, email Yandex user ID, iOS and Android ID, passport ID, et cetera, with social media accounts, Instagram, Facebook, and VK, which remember is a very Russian social media site. And, um, they have code here called Matcher that syncs fingerprinting events with major Russian telecoms providers. One of them, Ross Telecom, is Russian state owned. It also happens to provide broadband service to Crimea. So fingerprinting events that are synced with this provider through Crypta could be accessible to parts of the Russian state. Honestly irrelevant because it's about to be bought by a Russian oligarch if we're being honest. So here's the matcher, we're gonna zoom in a little bit. So you can see they build a connection to the API, pretty basic, they pass in this fingerprinting event. And uh, then Ross Telecom basically looks for a match in its own system. If it finds when it sends back its own user ID and what you get out, this is some test data that they had. Um, it's like half log, half fingerprint. Um, and it has that new external ID, it has that source. All right, so wrap up just in time. Um, so here is what they have. 
Here is just some of what they can do with that, and they have a UI to display this information, and they're probably about to be state controlled. So, so these Metrica SDKs, remember, give Yandex a very broad international reach of data subjects who probably don't even know that they are Yandex data subjects. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Sorry, I have to skip right through this now. Um, yeah. They make some gestures towards anonymization, but they undo it. Pay attention to who runs your SS SDKs, and remember that whatever data you're sharing with an app, um, that app can be sold at any minute, or you know, things can go very crazy in that app's home country, and then who knows who gets access to that data. So, here we have some useless QR codes, but they will be useful tomorrow if you want to take a picture. <laughs> Um, for later. So, any questions? Sorry, can you, I can't hear. Uh, for the information that's being collected, you were saying collects Wi-Fi SSIDs and all that. Yes. Do you know if there's any difference between Android and iOS in terms of what it can collect? Um, I don't see them, like, they certainly have, like, iOS and Android IDs and that's associated with that information, but I don't see them doing anything different with that data per se, other than where it's useful for segmenting. Yeah, yeah, okay, makes sense, thank you. Um, do, do you happen to know if the Yandex browser was included in the leak, like the source code for that? Uh, I'm pretty sure it was, but I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Okay. Because, I, I mean, it would certainly be nice to look at it for exploit search and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. There's probably a lot there. The data for um, Passport and Alice were also leaked. And, again, I haven't even, I just looked at Metrica and Crypto, basically. That's, so there's, oh, there's a lot more there. Any more questions? All right, thank you, Gandhi. And thank you, everybody, for a great talking.